Chapter 5 Buddhist Worldview I. The Significance of the World Problem In the previous chapters, we explored the origins of Buddhism and its spread in China. Now, let us move on to the question, why do we study Buddhism? In short, it is because the Dharma founded by Shakyamuni Buddha the teachings he spoke of reveals the true meaning of life and the mysteries of the universe. During his lifetime, Shakyamuni Buddha preached the Dharma for 49 years and held more than 300 Dharma meetings. The core of his teachings was the breaking of eye attachment and Dharma attachment. The so-called eye attachment refers to our attachment to the self, while the Dharma attachment refers to our attachment to all things in the universe. In other words, the content of Buddhism is to analyze the truth of life and the nature of the environment in which we live. As human beings, how can we be ignorant of ourselves and our environment? In order to recognize ourselves and our environment, we have to study Buddhism. So what is the purpose of studying Buddhism? In fact, it is very simple. It is to understand ourselves and our environment so that we will no longer be confused and troubled by them, so that we can turn confusion into enlightenment, leave suffering behind, and realize self-liberation and freedom. The essence of Buddhism, the Dharma mentioned by Shakyamuni Buddha, is actually the natural law of the universe. This law exists in the universe and was not created or formulated by Shakyamuni Buddha. The Buddha often said, the Dharma is as it is, meaning that the Dharma he spoke of is as it is in terms of natural law. However, with his supreme wisdom, the Buddha discovered the mystery of the universe. He became an enlightened being through liberation, not just for his own sake, but with the wish to convey this mystery to all beings in the hope that they would learn and practice according to his teachings, and thus attain the same enlightenment. This was the original purpose of the Buddha's teachings. When we talk about the mysteries of the universe and of life, we often encounter many perplexing questions. For example, how did the universe come into being? How long was it in time and space? Is there a law or master in control of it all? And then, for example, where did we as individuals come from and where are we going with our lives? And what is the value and meaning of life? Since ancient times, countless thinkers, philosophers, and scientists have explored these questions, but none of them seems to have found a satisfactory answer. However, these questions are satisfactorily explained in Buddhism. Before exploring the Buddhist worldview, let us first look at the philosophical explanation of the universe and life. The world in Buddhism is the universe as we understand it. In the ancient document, Huainanzi, there is a cloud, the four directions above and below are called Yu, and the past and present are called Zeus. There is a similar description in the Buddhist scriptures, the past, present and future are called the world, and the four dimensions of the southeast, northwest, up and down, are called the world. This shows that the Buddhist worldview, i.e., the cosmic view, is not very different from the common understanding. Cosmic view, i.e., the human view of the composition and change of the universe, and the realization of our place in the universe. In the East and West, there are many different interpretations of this issue, ranging from idealism to materialism. We can take a brief look at these views. In exploring the mysteries of the universe and life, we have to mention two philosophical views, materialism and idealism. I. Materialism, materialists believe that the most basic thing in the universe is matter, without which there is no world. They even believe that human beings are part of matter. For example, if a person loses his heart or brain, he cannot think, so they believe that the mind depends on the material body. Therefore, materialists believe that when a person dies, the physical body dies, and the mind disappears with it. They do not recognize the existence of a so-called spirit in the universe. In addition, they believe that all activities in the universe are the result of material activities, that cause and effect, striations, time and space, etc., are manifestations of physical properties, and that one cannot create laws of physics out of thin air. They believe that sensation is like the weight and ductility of an object, and that sensation complexity to a certain extent gives rise to conception, and conception further complexity gives rise to introspection. 
Although introspection shows that man has a mind, materialists believe that mind is produced by matter. Therefore, they put forward three arguments to prove the relationship between matter and mind, mind is a property of matter, mind is a result of matter, and mind is a part of matter. Second, idealism, idealism, also known as conceptualism, holds that spirit is the root of the universe and that everything in the universe originates from spirit. This spiritual action is manifested in human beings by concepts and in objects by forces. They believe that humans are able to understand the universe because they hold the most tangible ideas. Therefore, they believe that the universe is fundamentally rationally developed, that there is matter and there is spirit, that spirit is the cause of the existence of objects, and that every object is organized. All things in the universe are able to harmonize with each other without confusion, because each has spirit and organization. In exploring the mysteries of the universe and life, we also need to understand several philosophical views. Third, mind-matter dualism. Scholars of this school of thought believe that the universe is essentially composed of two natures, mind and matter, each of which has its own unique characteristics in the universe and cannot be integrated or attached to each other. They regard mind and matter as two separate entities, and body and matter are only combined and not merged. Four, Pluralism, contrary to monism, pluralism holds that the universe is not composed of a single element, but of more than one. Because each of the elements in the universe has its own different essence, a variety of different phenomena have emerged. Each of these different phenomena has a different root, and not all phenomena evolve from a single root. Each of these doctrines about the nature of the universe has its own strengths and weaknesses. For example, if the ontological nature of the universe is material, then the creation of life, the role of the spirit, and the transformation of abilities cannot be explained in terms of matter. If it is spiritual, but it is also true that matter exists, spirit cannot create matter. Mind-matter dualists believe that mind and matter each have independent properties, but that spirit cannot operate independently of the physical body. Pluralists believe that the composition of the universe is multi-elemental, which contradicts the unity of the universe. As for the mechanistic, purposive, harmonic and transcendentalist doctrines of the generation and evolution of the universe, they also have their own strengths and weaknesses, and cannot give us a satisfactory explanation. In addition, religionists believe that God created the world, the sun, moon, stars, men and women. This claim can be understood as a myth, but it cannot be taken as the truth of cosmic life. Then, how is the truth of cosmic life explained in Buddhism? Let us first take a look at the five skandhas mentioned in the sutras. The five aggregate worlds. When we talk about the universe or the world, we usually refer to the sum total of all the phenomena of birth, death, and change in time and space. In Buddhism, these phenomena are governed by karma, as the sutra says, all dharmas are born and all dharmas are destroyed because of karma. The root of karma in the universe is knowledge and name and color. In other words, the world is formed by the interaction between the subjectively cognizable body of knowledge and the objectively cognizable objects. Therefore, it is often said in the sutras, knowledge is bound to name and color, and name and color are bound to knowledge. So what are name and color? Names and colors are the five aggregates. In Buddhism, all things in the universe are created by the five skandhas. The five skandhas include, 1, color, 2, reception, 3, thought, 4, action, and 5, knowledge. Color refers to things that have volume, occupy space, and are perishable, which is similar to, but not identical with, what modern scientists call matter. The four species of color substance refer to the four substances of earth, water, fire, and wind, and also refer to the four properties of firmness, wetness, warmth, and movement. The colorful substances are the various things that are constructed out of these four properties. These things are divided into two kinds of properties, first, the tangible, touching and changing, such as mountains, rivers, grass and trees in nature as well as artificially made tables and chairs, etc. And second, the abstract manifestation of the square, such as the square and the circle, the length of the circle, the red and yellow, 
black and white, and the sweet, sour, bitter, and spicy, etc. To sum up, the five skandhas refer to the five elements of color, receptivity, thought, action, and knowledge that make up the universe. They are interdependent and interact with each other, and together they form the universe we know. Next, let's take a look at the five aggregates of reception, thought, and action. Reception Reception refers to the process of apprehending, that is, the process by which we perceive the realm and incorporate it into our heart. It is the emotional action of sentient beings in the universe. When what we apprehend is compatible with our mind and body, it gives rise to blissful receptions. If it is not, it gives rise to bitter receptions. This is the psychological equivalent of what is called emotion. Thinking. Thinking is taking images, that is, when we recognize the realm, we take in the images of the realm and transform them into mental images, thus forming concepts. This is the psychological equivalent of imagery. Acting. Acting means making, that is, we have an inner reaction to the realm, make a decision after careful consideration, and take action or speech. This is the psychological equivalent of what is called volition. Lastly, let's talk about the sense embodiment. Knowledge means separation, which refers to the fact that we recognize different things separately through our senses, such as the eyes recognizing red, blue, white, and black, the ears recognizing good and bad sounds, the nose recognizing fragrance and odor, the tongue recognizing bitterness and spiciness, and the body recognizing cold and warmth, etc. This is the psychological equivalent of knowing. This is equivalent to what is called cognition in psychology. These five skandhas constitute the fundamentals of all things in the universe, including human beings and all sentient beings, as well as the mountains, rivers, and earth on which all beings depend for their existence. In Buddhism, the universe and all sentient beings are collectively referred to as the world. Human beings and all sentient beings are called the sentient world, while the mountains, rivers, and earth on which all beings depend are called the instrumental world. The three skandhas of receptivity, thought, and action are originally mental activities, so why are they also included in the objective objects of cognition? There is a passage in the Mahayana Abhidharma Miscellany that explains. Q. Why are there only five skandhas? A. In order to manifest the five kinds of I-thing. That is to say, to manifest the body-me-thing, color, the use-me-thing, receptivity, the speech-me-thing, thought, the creation of all dharma unlawful me thing, action, and his dependence on my own body thing, knowledge. Of these five skandhas, the first four are eye affairs, and the fifth is the eye affair. Why is this so? It is because most of the sentient beings in the world regard the knowledge aggregate as the eye and the other four as the eye. The meaning of this passage is that people usually think that the eyes, ears, nose, and tongue are mine, the colors, sounds, smells, and tastes are mine to touch, my senses are mine because I feel them, my memories are mine because I think them, and my actions are mine because I do them. My behavior, therefore action, is mine. These four kinds of physical and mental phenomena are all observed and recognized by I, so they are all I am. But what is the I that can observe and recognize? It is only the knowledge of the unified state of mental activity. Therefore, we say that consciousness is the subjective I, and color, receptivity, thought, and action are objective objects. The subjective I and the objective objects are interdependent and interact with each other, and together they constitute the world, which is what is called in Buddhism, knowledge is bound to name and color, and name and color are bound to knowledge. But it is important to note that knowledge and name and color, the subjective and objective conditions, are not two things. Knowledge is the knowledge in name and color, and name and color are the name and color in knowledge. The subjective that is, is a condition that constitutes the objective, and the objective is a condition that constitutes the subjective. Without the subjective, the objective cannot exist. Without the objective, the subjective cannot exist. That is why it is said in the sutras, knowledge is bound to name and color, and name and color are bound to knowledge. When this is born, it is born. 
When this is extinguished, it is extinguished. The relationship between knowledge and name and color is illustrated in a passage in the miscellaneous Arhat Sutras, the Buddha said. For example, there are two bundles of reeds that depend on each other in order to stand. Friends, there is knowledge because of name and color, and knowledge, because of name and color. When this one is born, the other is born, and when this one is extinguished, the other is extinguished, and so it is. My friends, if you take away this one, that one cannot stand up, and if you take away that one, this one cannot stand up either. When name and color are extinguished, knowledge is extinguished, and when knowledge is extinguished, name and color are extinguished, just as it is again. How do knowledge and name and color the subjective and objective conditions constitute the universe? In the next section, we will discuss the causal birth of all dharmas. The causal birth of all dharmas. When the Buddha was alive, he preached the Dharma at the bamboo grove in the city of Wangshi. At that time, there were two sadhus who practiced lay Buddhism, Shariputra and Mukamadutra, who had superior wisdom and outstanding reputation. One day, Sherifo met the Buddha's disciple, Ma Shing Bhikkhu, on the road. Seeing that Ma Shing Bhikkhu's manners and demeanor were outstanding, he could not help but be filled with admiration, so he went up to him and asked, May I ask who your master is? What teachings does he usually teach? Ma Shing Bhikkhu replied, My master is Shakyamuni, whose wisdom and powers are unrivaled. I am still young and have not practiced long enough to fully understand my master's profound teachings. Shariputra insisted, please be merciful and briefly describe your master's teachings. Ma Shing Bhikkhu then recited a verse, all dharmas are born from karma, and karma is thankful that dharmas are still extinguished. My master, the great shamans, have always said so. When Shariputra heard this, his mind was enlightened, so he went back to Megiddo, told him the good news, and took their disciples with him to convert to the Buddha. Why did Shariputra abandon his studies and convert to the Buddha after hearing these two words, all dharmas are born because of karma, and when karma is gone, dharmas are destroyed? In fact, these two sentences reveal the truth of the universe. Shariputra was known for his wisdom among the disciples of the Buddha, and he had already practiced for many years, so when he heard these teachings, he immediately had an epiphany and decided to convert to the Buddha. In Buddhism, the creation and demise of everything in the universe is attributed to the word karma. These two words do not have a strict definition in Buddhism, but they can be understood as cause and effect in terms of their relative differences. The term cause refers approximately to the characteristics of a thing, while karma refers to the power of a thing. The cause is the main condition for the birth and death of things, while the cause is a secondary condition. To put it simply, everything that comes into being and exists needs to fulfill certain conditions and has mutual relations with other things. These conditions and relationships are the causes of things. In the Four Aha Sutras, the explanation of cause and effect is. This is there, therefore it is there. This is born, therefore it is born, this is not there, therefore it is not there, this is extinguished, therefore it is extinguished. This indicates that all things in the universe do not exist absolutely. They exist in a relative dependence relationship. This relationship is divided into two kinds. Simultaneous and diachronic. The heterochronous relationship is the continuity of cause and effect, and there is cause and effect. The simultaneous relationship is the master and the slave, and there is no absolute center or edge. Thus, in time, cause and effect are continuous, with no beginning and no end. In space, master and slave are connected, with no absolute center or margin. This causal and master-slave relationship constitutes this complex and changeable world, whether they are diachronic cause and effect relationships or simultaneous master slave relationships, their fundamental conditions are not outside the five aggregates. The five skandhas, due to their causality and harmony, constitute the instrumental and sentient worlds of mountains, rivers, earth, and sentient beings. In this world, all things are born and die and change, and change is unpredictable. So, in this process of birth and death and change, is there a law or law? 
The answer is yes, and this law is the Buddhist law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect. The birth of the universe is not the creation of God, and the changes of all things are not manipulated by God. They are all the result of karma and harmony. This process of creation from nothing is called karma from the perspective of cause, and karma from the perspective of effect. Therefore, Buddhism refers to all things in the universe as karmically generated laws, and refers to their existence as the karmic birth of all dharmas. Since everything in the universe is born of karmic harmony, it is naturally inevitable that it will change and decay. From sentient beings to the world of vessels, from spiritual phenomena to material phenomena, they are all in constant motion, change, birth and decay, never stopping. The birth, old age, sickness, and death of sentient beings, and the birth, residence, and extinction of the instrumental world all reflect the flow and impermanence of all dermas. So, is there some kind of law in this process of flow, birth and death? The answer is yes. In Buddhism, there is a basic law that governs the birth and death of all things in the universe, and that is the law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect, that is, the study of the cause and effect of things. Modern science also has the law of cause and effect, but it applies only to physical changes. The law of cause and effect in Buddhism, on the other hand, applies to changes in the mind, changes in things, and changes in the mixture of mind and things. Buddhism has analyzed this law in depth and in detail, and based on it, it has created the concept of life in the three lifetimes, linking the issues of karma and reincarnation, and forming the theoretical idea that cause and effect, good and evil, permeate the three lifetimes. Karma, in its entirety, should be cause and effect. The cause is the cause, the karma is the supporting cause, and the thing produced by the harmony of cause and karma is called the fruit, and this fruit is the reward for the cosmaker. Whether in the world or out of the world, from sentient beings to Buddhas, from the root body to the realm of vessels, all births, deaths, and changes are governed by this law. Nothing can arise without cause. Even if there is a cause, it cannot arise without a corresponding cause. For example, a seed will not germinate and grow without a sower burying it in the earth and aiding causes such as sunlight and rain. So it is with the generation of things, and so it is with the change and demise of things. In order to expound the cause and effect relationship of all dharmas, Buddhism has put forward the theory of six causes, four karmas, and five fruits. The six causes include the capable cause, the all-pervasive cause, the corresponding cause, the like cause, the pervasive cause, and the dissimilar cause. The five fruits include the fruits of increase, simultaneous fruits, equinoctial fruits, dissimilar fruits, and dissimilar fruits. Due to space limitations, it is not possible to introduce each of them in detail, so here is only a brief introduction to the four karmas. The four karmas refer to the procausal karmas, the equinoctial karmas, the dependent karmas, and the increasing karmas. The procausal karmas, i.e., the primary causes. At the mental, spiritual, level, one's bodily, oral, and mental actions and intentions are called karma, and karma is the cause of change in the mental dharma. At the level of color dharma, matter, for example, earth and stone are the primary causes of mountains, and seeds are the primary causes of herbs. Equanimity of causes applies only to mind dermis. For example, our deluded mind is incessant in its thoughts, with the former thought being extinguished and the latter being born, and this continuous and uninterrupted action of birth and death is called an equanimous cause. The karmic edge refers to the fact that when the separate mind is confronted with the separate phase, the former and the latter are the karmic edge, and this karmic edge is the auxiliary edge that gives birth to the mind. The increasing karmas are all the dermas of the mind or the dermas of color. It plays the role of shunyata, etc., and affects the growth of causes. At the level of color dermas, as long as there is a prokas and the two increasing karmas, the fruit can be born. However, in mind dermas and mixed mind color dermas, all four karmas are needed to produce fruits. To summarize, the law of cause and effect has three basic principles. The first is that fruits are born from causes. 
Without a cause, there can be no fruit. With a cause and a cause, there is bound to be fruit. The second is that things wait for reason to come to fruition. Although there is cause and effect in the birth and death of all laws, there is also universal reason in cause and effect. A certain cause must produce a certain result, is the inevitable rule of reason, for example, there must be life and death, there must be bad, are the inevitable rule of reason. Thirdly, there is the establishment of emptiness according to emptiness. Anything that exists, or any rule of reason, must be established by the nature of the negation of reality. In other words, whatever exists is initially non-existent. All that is there must be established in accordance with emptiness. 5. The karmic view of the non-duality of mind and matter. From the five skandhas to the karmic birth of all dharmas to the law of cause and effect, we have explored the Buddhist worldview. So what exactly is the Buddhist worldview? The Buddhist worldview is essentially neither idealistic nor materialistic, but a world of five skandhas in which mind and matter are indivisible and one and the same. In this world, knowledge is bound to name and color, and name and color are bound to knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge within name and color, and name and color are name and color within knowledge. In generation, the Buddhist worldview is neither mechanistic nor purposive, but rather causal, master-slave related, heavily drawn, and interdependent. From the point of view of effect, it is the law born of karma. From the point of view of cause, it is the worldview of karma and harmony, which is all law is born of cause. In terms of the operating law of the universe, the Buddhist worldview is neither dominated by God nor by the gods of heaven, but by the law of cause and effect, in which fruits are born from causes, things are to be realized by reason, karma does not cease to exist, and self-karma is self-suffering. Finally, in summary, the Buddhist worldview can be called a karmic conception of the mind and matter as non-dual, one and complete, and from an epistemological point of view. The 3000 Worlds In Buddhism, the world is divided into the sentient world and the world of vessels. The sentient world, also known as the positive karma, is the positive result of karmic causes. Sentience here refers to the physical and spiritual bodies of sentient beings. The sentient world, on the other hand, also known as dependent karma, refers to the mountains, rivers, earth, clothing and food on which sentient beings depend. The sentient world contains the six paths of beings, which exist in the desire, color, and colorless realms. The six paths are the hell path, hungry ghost path, animal path, human path, azura path, and heaven path. These beings live in different realms, each with their own desires and ways of being. Beings in the lust realm have desires for sleep, food, and men and women. Beings in the color realm do not have these desires, but only the exceptional form of the body. Beings in the colorless realm not only have no desires, they do not even have a body, but only a spiritual existence. According to Buddhism, the small worlds centered on Mount Sumeru are spread throughout the entire cosmic space, not just one, but countless. These small worlds constitute the small thousand worlds, the middle thousand worlds, and the great thousand worlds. Since there is an overlap of 3,000 numbers in each of the great thousand worlds, they are called the 3,000 great thousand worlds. These worlds are not fixed, but are constantly cyclical and never-ending. In space, the worlds are boundless. In time, they have no beginning or end. But in the law of cause and effect, cause and effect circulate, and time also has no beginning or end. There are four periods of the world, namely, formation, abiding, destruction, and emptiness. The period of formation is the period of formation of the world. The period of abiding is the period when sentient beings settle down. The period of destruction is the period of gradual destruction. And the period of emptiness is the period of complete collapse. After the collapse, the world enters the kalpa again, and so on, endlessly. Jhana is a Sanskrit word meaning a long period of time. The complete cycle of a world from kalpa to kalpa is called a kalpa, and the kalpa is divided into four intermediate kalpas, namely, kalpa, 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 and kalpa, 
each of which consists of 20 minor kalpas. The duration of each kalpa is the period of time when a person's lifespan decreases from the highest number 84,000 years to the lowest number 10 years and then increases from the lowest number to the highest number, with the amount of increase and decrease decreasing by one year every hundred years, and the same is true for increase. The increase is the same. The time required for such an increase and decrease is a small kalpa. This boundless space, beginningless and endless time, as well as an infinite number of living beings, all follow the law of cause and effect to be born, to change, and to perish. This is the world described in the Buddhist scriptures.